Wireless data. It's what connects us to just about everything. And full power license spectrum is how it gets from point A to point B. Americans will use five times more 5G data by 2027. To make sure all Americans benefit from secure, reliable 5G networks, we need more full power license spectrum. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. What is going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar. Danny, how how do I sound right now? You sound pretty good, man. Okay. I'm looking at my microphone and I'm confused. It's been a while, so I forgot how to use it. Ha! Are you on the dickhead mode? <laughs> um, I'm on the dickhead mode, and I believe I'm at three knots on the microphone. Three, three, three dots and dickhead mode. Gotcha. Three, Sounds three, three dots and dickhead mode. The setting of our microphones. Yes. All right. So we're all good. Um, everyone can hear me. Um, hey guys, nice to speak with you. Um, I know we've been gone for a couple of weeks. Or when's our when's been our when's been our last episode? Two weeks. When ago? was the last yeah. time we dropped our last episode? Oh, okay. I don't feel yeah. that bad. I don't feel that bad. And then we had that long interview with Scott the the week before. But yeah, yeah. Um, it's been a while. We've been kind of brainstorming on on different episodes that we want to do, and also taking a little time off for the summer. And we are going to do some stuff on World War II. And essentially, I think what we're doing, and, and we don't really know, and you know, you guys know that we were doing the Russian Revolution thing. Well. I think we're going to combine a lot of the stuff that we did for the Russian Revolution into the subject of World War II. And it's basically just going to be a early 20th century, um, I don't want to say series, because I don't want you to hold me to the fire and say it's a series, but we're going <laughs> to we'll do... See what, we'll con- see what happens. <laughs> we're going to concentrate on a lot of like early 20th century stuff, including World War II, Russian Revolution... Um, you know the rise of the states after World War uh, after World War One, um, U.S. foreign policy, Roosevelt. So those are a lot of the topics that we've been really kind of, uh, we've been really thinking about lately, and that we've been reading about. And um, we're gonna talk, yeah, about it, yeah, right. It's these hey, this, these right. topics all take an incredible amount of time searching and really get intelligent thoughts around. And it's also hard to figure out like what hasn't already been said. <laughs> so, you know, that takes some time. Yeah. Well, I guess the main thing that we're going to do, and the reason why we're not going to, I don't know if we're going to do this in chronological order or what, but probably essentially <laughs> we're just going to be jumping in from topic to topic. And, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it makes sense. It's not meant to be one kind of linear timeline. You're supposed to hit different topics, but maybe it will sort of end up like that. Who knows? We're just testing the waters right here, um, but we're not foolish enough to to um, sign up for. Hey, guys, we're doing a series on the origins of World War II. We're not that dumb. Um, if you guys listen to the Origins of World War One series, that was hard. Right. That was really hard. We also didn't plan on it being a series in the first place either, so (laughs) it just turned into it. But I think the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set it up, the topic. We're going to set up and we're we're going to talk about the borders after World War I. So World War I, where we're at, World War I is over. The Allies won. And um, essentially... Europe is completely being reshaped. The entire world is being reshaped into different nations. Other other countries are, are receiving territories. A bunch of empires are falling apart. Um, I'm going to start this off with a great quote from the British historian Adam Tooze, who, um, you know, he's an economic historian. He writes a lot about the early 20th century. He writes a lot about, like, the economic situation in, in, um, in Nazi Germany. Um, he writes a lot about the the rise of the United States as like the predominant superpower in the world uh, after World War One, 
And he had a great quote uh, from his uh, from his book Deluge, uh, which is about the rise of the U.S. after World War One. The Great War may have begun in the eyes of many participants as a clash of empires, a classic great power war, but it ended as something far more morally and politically charged, a crusading victory for, for a coalition that proclaimed itself the champion of a new world order. With an American president in the lead, the war to end all wars was fought and won to uphold the role of international law and to put down autocracy and militarism. As a natural consequence, politics based on the people reflected the will of the people, namely democracy, has, like a race to a heaven, conquered the thought of the entire world. This moralization and politicization of international affairs was a high-stakes wager. Since the wars of religion in the 17th century, conventional understanding of international politics and international law had erected a firewall between foreign policy and domestic politics. Conventional morality and domestic notions of law had no place in a world of a great power diplomacy and war. By breaching this wall, the architects of this new world organization were quite consciously playing the game of revolutionaries. Indeed, by 1917, the revolutionary purpose was being made more and more explicit. Regime change had become a precondition for armistice negotiations. Versailles assigned war guilt and criminalized the Kaiser. Woodrow Wilson and the Indian Taunt had pronounced a death sentence on the Ottoman and the Habsburg Empire. By the end of the 1920s, aggressive war had been outlawed. But, appe- but appealing as these liberal precepts might have been, they begged fundamental questions. What gave the victorious powers a right to lay down law in this way? Did might make right? What wager were they placing on history to bear them out? Could such, a claim, could such claims form a durable foundation of an international order? So today we want to talk about this, this, this world order that is created after World War I and, and really kind of the physical appearance that it takes. And um, I know there's a lot to unpack on this quote. Danny, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say those are a lot of really good questions, things that I've been thinking about over the last few weeks since we've been kind of studying this. But but go ahead. What, what do you think? Uh, uh, what do you think about that? So I think for me, one way to look at the Second World War is that it was a German rebellion against the world order that was created after World War One. So this revolutionary world order that's created by the Allied powers during the Paris Peace Accords, meaning Germany had a very specific goal of overturning the resulting settlements of the First World War. Before 1914, there had been a balance of power in continental Europe. It was, you know, the Franco-Russian alliance with Great Britain on the periphery, Great Britain being loosely associated with France, and then, you know, the, it was the Franco-Russian alliance against the central powers, the central powers of Germany, um, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And, of course, Italy backstabs the, 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 the central powers during the war. Um, but the thing is, though, is that they, they, they was kind of, um, there was a symbiotic relationship. They all balanced each other out. Mm-hmm. Uh, one couldn't really overtake the other. And one of the reasons why World War I was so horrible was that no one was really capable of delivering that knockout blow, therefore ending the war quickly, um, like many of the general staffs were making on. Thus, the war dragged on, and there was these giant stalemates, and you know, we all know what the Western Front looks like. The Eastern Front moved around a little bit more, but you know, towards the end of the war, before the Russian Revolution happened, the Russians were actually modernizing their army and you know they they were pretty formidable by the end of the war but the revolution happened and you know that they they um you know they uh, signed a treaty to leave the war afterwards but when the war ended in november of 1918 for germany um i think one of the key things that you have to remember is that germany still existed the german army still existed right it, wasn't it, had, it had been on retreat mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't demolished. It wasn't destroyed like in World War II. Um, it was still... Um, and the other thing, meanwhile, the British and the French armies were also near exhaustion, meaning in order for the Allies to deliver, to, to really deliver that knockout blow, the U.S. would have to take on the brunt of the war. And essentially, they would have to march into Berlin like the, like the Soviets did to Berlin in World War II. Totally conquer the place. 
and um, you know that that wasn't going to happen, um, mainly because if that did happen, the U.S. would be in the driver's seat when it came to dictating the post-war terms. Um, you know, they already had enough influence, but you know, if, if they were the ones who Germany surrendered to, then you know they would be able to really outline the terms and conditions uh, for the peace. France and Britain were able to achieve their goals. So, you know, their, some of their primary goals, of course, are the elimination of the German fleet, that the, the, the liberation of, um, you know, northeastern France, the, the um, you know, France regaining uh, territory that was already lost in the Franco-Prussian War. They were, they were able to achieve all those goals through an armistice. So not an unconditional surrender. And... Um, you know, German society at that time, you know, even though the German army was able to put up a resistance, it was devastated. So Germany had about 1.7 million killed in action. Um, they had about half a million civilians dead due to the Allied blockade and food shortages. Um, you know, the German economy was in complete ruin. There were military mutinies. There were, you know, socialist radical groups. There were mass strikes. Germany had become extremely politically unstable. So, um, you know, by November 19 of 1918, you know, there had been more than, I think, about a dozen major cities in Germany that were effectively controlled by mutinous soldiers, um, in addition to left-wing revolutionary groups. So, you know, the Kaiser essentially was losing control of, of the state. When... Um, you know, when Kaiser Wilhelm tried to muster up the military strength that, that crushed these rebel groups, his general staff just straight up told him that he no longer had the loyalty of the military. And he was forced to advocate on November 9th of 1918. And he didn't even advocate himself. It was uh, the, he was the German chancellor. <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was abdicated. So the, the German chancellor, Prince Max von Baden, he's the one who made the announcement on the radio that he was going to, um, that the Kaiser was no longer in power. So he did it without his, uh, without his consent. But at the same time this is going on, the Germans, the new German government, they were negotiating with, with um, the French to effectively end the war. And then two days later, they agreed to a pre-armistice contract that bound the Allies to make a final peace treaty that would be that would conform to Wilson's 14 points. So Wilson's 14 points, something that I'm sure people have learned in their social studies class in sixth grade. It's the the address that he made to Congress in the beginning of 1918. So before before um, before the end of the war, it was it was the blueprint for a non vindict vindictive peace. So, you know, there, there shall be no contributions, no punitive damages. People are not to be handed about from one sovereignty to another by, by an international conference, yada, yada, yada. There's a bunch of things about reparations and, and all that. And, you know, it shouldn't be too severe and, and national determination and all that jazz. Formation of a League now, of um, Nations. <laughs> yeah. Now, during, during the, the pre-armistice negotiations, um, you know, Wilson did insist that conditions of, of any type of armistice had to make renewals of hostilities on the part of Germany impossible. So the terms of the armistice called for an immediate evacuation of German troops from occupied Belgium, France, and Luxembourg within 15 days. And in addition, it established the that um, it established Allied forces over over um, to, to occupy the Rhineland. So. The Germans were forced to surrender their battle fleet and submarines, so, um, some 1,700 airplanes, 5,000 artillery, 30,000 machine guns, and other war materials. And essentially, Germany was in a position where they were at the mercy of the Allies. They were defenseless and depended on Wilson and the Allies keeping their word that a final peace agreement that wouldn't be too harsh. So during this time, um, you have to also take note is that you know, um, you know something that will that um, that um, Winston Chamberlain was really proud of because one of is one of his ideas that the blockade of Germany. 
And um, there was there was an active hunger blockade that started during the war, and it was actually expanded after the armistice was was, was agreed upon when the Allies took control of the German Baltic coast. And it was really bad that, you know, German fishing boats were banned. Um, people were absolutely starving. J- just picture people eating out of the trash and stuff like that. Um, you know, you, you'll, he, if you look into this, like you'll, you'll hear about elderly family members who are making the, the decision to die so there would be enough food for the rest of their family. You know, these people were living in complete destitute. Like the amount of calories was something like 800 calories a day for like the average person Mm -hmm. on average for sustained periods. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's it's crazy. I mean, that's this definitely does lend a little bit of credence to, you know, what you said earlier about, you know, how you could look at the Second World War being a German rebellion against the world order that was created after World War One, because here, you know, we're saying the 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 new German government basically abdicates the Kaiser gets rid of them right and then capitulates to the allies and says all right cool we'll give you all of our guns and stuff like that you guys figure out a peace deal and try not to make it too bad as long as it follows the 14 points that wilson's saying i I think it should be fine right and what we're seeing here is kind of 180 a little bit right so we're seeing quite the opposite of that happening uh land being taken reparations um, being imposed upon Germany and, you know, also just the, the, the taking away of, of Germany's uh, ability to, to defend themselves. So really at this point, they've got them by the balls. So, you know, you're making some, well, yeah. And of course, there. I mean, in the mind, in the mind of the allies, especially France, it was, it was the German ability, the Germans ability to invade them again, because the, Ger- the Germans had occupied France for the entire war. They had, they had occupied France to the moment they surrendered. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there was, it was security concerns for them, but also it was just essentially the, so much, so much was spent and there was such a horrible cost, economic and, and human cost to the war that public opinion wanted them to pay or well, politicians. Yeah, there's that. There, there's also a bit of vengeance going on there because as, as you know, that the, the treaties, the drafts were all, all done you know, without, without the German delegation whatsoever, right? It was, it was drafted and written up by the French, the British and, and, and the U S and then just handed to the, the Germans and saying, here, here's your deal. And they also ignored any of the, um, like rebuttals in that, in that, in that part. So, you know, I think <laughs> it's kind of a tricky thing because, you know, after world war one, the, 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 the folks that got together in Versailles, you know, they're all dependent on, on U.S. authority because the U.S. basically came to the to the Allies' uh, defense and, and, you know, they didn't lose any land. I mean, they lost hundreds of thousands of soldiers, but, you know, they, for the most part, won, you know, if we're comparing. The U.S. <laughs> the US lost about 53,000 pe- soldiers killed in combat and another forty to 50,000, uh, or, or I think it was more than that, around 60,000 who died of an influenza. Right, so and casualties war. of war, mm-hmm. um, and then this also the you know what half a million people who died to the Spanish flu, mainly from soldiers who were bringing it back, right from from Europe. Right, so, so you I could mean, I mean there was considered that as well, bust. right? But but I mean generally speaking, uh, the U.S. was was doing pretty well. Um, obviously, they didn't lose any land. There wasn't any like major wars on their turf. Um, they also. Uh, uh, the U.S. also was was loaning a great deal of money to you know uh, countries in Europe thanks to the bankers, which I'd love to maybe pursue in a different episode. But um, but the U.S. basically had an opportunity to like you know shape the world or, or its vision of politics onto the world. You know, um, but yeah, I mean it's it's the the idea the problem there was that Woodrow Wilson's vision for like this new international order was was obviously different from what Britain and France wanted and frankly all the other countries that were on the winning side of the war everybody had their own ideas on what you know what post world war 1 would look like and that's what the treaty of versailles ends up becoming it's like a compromise between america's vision and the demands of you know 
those old imperial powers. Yeah, and, and to make and to make and, and exactly so, you know, there were sides who were running. There, there were countries that were were that were jumping on the winning side mm-hmm. when the when the tables were turned. It, right. it wasn't for any type of moralistic reason. It was it was one hundred percent out of like gaining territory or 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 fleecing you know the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the you know these empires of fair of weather land fans, basically and, and expanding their state. You know, like Italy, Italy was is is like the prime example of. The most fair weather partner ever, where they were, you know, they they flip sides. Uh, you know, they were they they were more aligned with the central powers prior to the war, and and you know they were they had a secret treaty with 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 the UK to to join the war in 1915 in, in, in exchange for some territorial. Uh, I forget what what was presented to what the full extent was promised to them but I'll, I'll get into what Italy got uh, when we go over the land concessions um, but yeah I mean one of the key things that you had mentioned that these were all dictates there was no there was no actual negotiation that was taking place between and I mean the two powers that were left out obviously Germany was but also Russia because Russia was no longer Russia they were now the Soviet Union the Soviet Union was instantly a pariah so they were not invited obviously um, now The, I guess to make things worse, or to, to kind of add in, insult to injury, is that the, you know, the Wilson's famous fourteen points, when applied to Germany, they were they were they were totally ignored, and Germany surrendered under these terms. They said, you know, we're, we're going to surrender under the under the fourteen points that if you confirm that, um, that you'll conform to the fourteen points that Wilson had mentioned, where things aren't going to get too bad. And, um, you know, the, the first thing that happens is that they're forced to accept complete responsibility for the war, which, which is really unprecedented in the history of peace negotiations where one party, the losing party, is, has to take complete responsibility for pretty much all of the problems that happen. And if you know anything, I mean, we did a whole thing about the origins of World War I. There's like more than enough blame for everyone, really. It's it's mm-hmm. hard. You really can't choose one country, but you can you can really pick Russia. You can pick you can you can say the French. You can say the Germans, Austria-Hungarian. I'm honestly the Aust- Austrian Austria-Hungary probably had the least to do with starting the war yeah. out of all the powers. Right. I mean, they were just responding to their head of state being or their heir to the head of state being assassinated, but. You know, they all had their all imperial positions. It was all out of greed. No one was a good guy there. Um, but there was this, you know, public opinion in Britain and France was very much set on making Germany pay. I mean, there was, of course, that vengeance factor. Um, you know, they both, both the Britain and France lost well over a million people. So just think about all the widows and stuff and all the brothers and families that lost kids. I mean, you're going to want your enemy your enemy to pay and just the, the economic devastation. You know, there's also like, you know, we spent all this money. Why not make the Germans pay for this? These, I think a, a, an important note is that these peace negotiations in Paris in 1919, they were all taking place in the public eye. So you had a kind of a very hostile press or a, a press that was bent on covering this story. Mm-hmm. And if Lloyd George or the French Prime Minister Clemenceau, um, they're, if they you know, were seen as appeasing Germany or, or you know, not getting as good as a deal... Their political futures would have been completely ruined. Like they would have been over. Right. Um, the 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 French the French Chamber of Deputies, you know they were they were nicknamed the One Leg Chamber because it was just full of guys with one leg from you know losing limbs in the war. Right. You know these this was a, this was a group that wasn't going to be satisfied with, uh, with with nothing less than a punitive peace. And you know they had their champion in Marshal Falk, who who Marshal Falk was the Allied commander, and the he was the Allied commander in chief during the final stage of the war. You know he was at Paris, and he was basically there to attack Clemenceau if he moderated any of his stances um, at at Paris. So it was um, you know they they didn't really have an opportunity. They they were you know the pressure was to to make them pay. 
And then the same thing happened with Italy as well, because, you know, when Italy sent their delegations, um, they, I mean, Italy took outstanding losses in the war. Um, more people than more losses than what people really realize. The war in the Alps that took place between Italy and Austria, Hungary was terrible. It was absolutely horrendous. It's, it's a forgotten part of the war, but, um, you know, there was there was upwards of a million Italian soldiers who died, and they were, you know, they were they were pissed. Promised <laughs> land from the Allies yeah. for this sacrifice, and I mean, their and their war effort didn't even move the needle any, it, it, which is like the sad thing. Um, but the Prime Minister Orlando, he would have been charged with treason by the you know the the extreme nationalist elements of Italy if he had not, you know, um, you know, if he didn't get the territorial gains that they were expecting or if they got anything less or if he didn't fight for them. So, you know, there was this, you know, there was all this pressure to, you know, essentially kind of fleece Germany. Now, uh, this episode is brought to you by Google. Cyber attacks on critical infrastructure threaten essential services. That's why public institutions like schools, hospitals, and government agencies across the country are partnering with Google to keep their data safe and secure. Because when organizations run on Google Cloud, they're defended by the same AI-powered security that protects all of Google. Explore how Google is keeping more Americans safe online. Visit safety.google forward slash cybersecurity today. China is making 370% more 5G spectrum available than America. Tell Congress to restore FCC auction authority and allocate more 5G spectrum to make sure America leads the industries and innovations of the future. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Um, yeah, Italy's land is, is uh, I have it written down. So they were, they were offered, so some of the land that they were promised was actually given to us to uh, Greece and the new Yugoslavia state, which we'll, which we'll get into. And, I'll add this. Woodrow Wilson, as much as I poo-poo on Woodrow Wilson, as much as as much shit I talk about Woodrow Wilson, he was, I mean, he was disgusted by all this. He was disgusted by the, all this. And, you know, the American public was disgusted by the idea of a League of Nations at the end of this. You know, when they went back, Congress doesn't approve it because they basically say, Hey, we're not fighting over these European power, these greedy, these greedy Europeans. Um, this is going to get dra- this is going to drag us into another war. So, um, you know, I guess to his credit, you know, this wasn't what he wanted to go down. But again, it's the compromise between the the liberal order, the new liberal order that that Woodrow Wilson represents, and then the old imperialists like Brit- like Britain and France, and then all these. Um, opportunistic nations who are, you know, trying to, you know, get whatever territory they can out of the settlement. Because again, the whole world is being redrawn at this moment. So imagine if the whole world was redrawn now, like what, what, what would happen or what would be the outcome? Just, it's just kind of crazy to, to think about that. If it's all the borders uh, within Europe or wherever are just redrawn instantly. And there's these new countries that appear out of nowhere. It's a kind of a crazy thing to think about, especially if you if you go by the 14 points, because there's um, some provisions in the 14 points that that uh, talk about um, like distribution of land by by nationality. And if you think about uh, multinational areas, you know, and geographies, like how do you even draw that? You know, like would 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 there be like a a white America and a black America, <laughs> you know, like, or a Latin America, North America, you know, like it's, it's interesting. I'm sure we're going to talk about it later though, but yeah, we'll jump into it, but let me just finish my, my thought on, on Germany and we'll probably get into this in another episode about, I don't want to get too far into reparations because I want to concentrate on the territory changes, but the, the results, the end results of the, of the treaty are ger- at least for the German army, the German army is capped at a hundred thousand men. And we're talking about a standing army of what, like 10 million during the war. They're capped at a hundred, they're, they're capped at a hundred thousand men 
No planes, no tanks, no submarines. And the whole left bank of the Rhine was permanently demilitarized. Yep. Also note, no and, general staff and only enough ammo for 14 days worth of battle. Yeah. And then this is against, obviously, the point. There's there's point four of the 14 points with that that was... Um, that it was supposed to be a reduction of arms worldwide, not the reduction of arms and just the dearming of one nation. Um, and then, of course, German colonies were forfeited. Um, you know, they were all converted into, into a League of Nation mandates, and they were, you know, they were, you know, the spoils were given out to uh, pretty much everyone. Um, and then, you know, there's point five which was a free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of a colonial claim. And then, of course, the, the treaty called for a unspecified amount of reparations, so in con- on contradiction to the, to the no punitive damages. So, I mean, this was, uh, this was something that, ups- this is in the background in the 1920s and 1930s, we, when you see the rise of National Socialism, it's in the, that, the background. Now, I don't blame everything on the Treaty of Versailles. I think there's this is one of the major aspects of the Treaty of Versailles when it comes to the origins of World War II. Another big thing, obviously, is the reaction to the Bolshevik Revolution, which I don't think we're going to get in today. But there's obviously a reaction to the Bolshevik Revolution that takes place in Germany as well, mm-hmm. which leads to which leads to the the second world war but um let's talk about the territory changes okay yeah i mean like the whole point of, of our episode today is really to talk about these territory changes because this is probably the the this is this is the thing that that most of the losing parties of world war one find like the most resent for uh the territory changes so uh the, to to kind of level set there were four empires that collapse after World War One. We have the German Empire, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. And after the war ends, the Allies basically bust out their crayons and start redrawing all the maps and, and created all these new states across Europe and, and indeed across the world, you know, um, through various treaties like the one that we've been talking about, the Treaty of Versailles. So where Versailles handled uh, the German territories, and, and they did lose a bit of land there. The Treaty of Trianon, uh, which was another one that came out of this, uh, handled Austria-Hungary. And I wanted to spend just a quick minute talking about that because uh, this one was actually the craziest one for me. Um, so this treaty set out to basically implement the principle of, quote, self-determination of peoples, right, by establishing national states for non-Hungarian populations. And as a result, uh, Austria-Hungary was divided into several countries. So we had Austria, Hungary, but also new ones, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Romania. And this treaty left Hungary basically landlocked and drastically smaller. For some context, uh, the new Hungary, uh, uh, it it was about 28% of its former land area and had a population of 7.6 million which was just 36% of its pre-war population. So giant slash, right? Like imagine just chop up the United States and you're left with a third of it maybe and a third of its pre, uh, pre-war pre population. Absolutely nuts. And a lot of these areas uh, with Hungarian populations were basically given to these newly created neighboring countries, which resulted in Hungarians becoming pretty much overnight minorities in like new regions and the treaty also imposed kind of super similar restrictions on hungary as you know the versailles treaty did on germany where uh hungary's military was reduced to thirty-five thousand personnel i forget exactly how big their standing army was beforehand but this major drop right down to thirty-five thousand, and uh, also got rid of the navy um also they're landlocked so <laughs> i don't know what they would do with the navy in the first place right um, and finally, like the Treaty of Versailles for Germany, the Trianon also made Hungary pay some more reparations to its neighboring countries. And in this respect, Henry, I just kind of want to talk a little bit about this because, you know, w- you could see uh, World War II as a, as a German reaction to, you know, the, 
the bad parts of the Treaty of Versailles, right? You know, a lot of people are very angry with, you know, those outcomes. And, and indeed, they probably deserve to be angry about them. Um, of course, a lot of the arguments that were made about being upset about, you know, these types of treaties were the exact arguments that, you know, Hitler was making. But if you compare it to the Treaty of Trianon, that, you know, Germany kind of made out all right, comparatively. <laughs> yeah. Well, Germany wasn't, Germany, Germany loses land, but they're still unified. Right. You know, they still have a, they still have a huge population. They still have a population of 60 million people at the right. end of the war. They're still the largest country in Europe. Right. Excluding Russia, um, excluding Russia. And but, they, um, they dodged a bullet because Clemenceau wanted to carve up Germany until like, I think it's, I forget the exact number. It was a lot of different micro states, micro German states based on like some historical um yeah and now, i mean historically germany has always been a bunch of micro states right um, but that's what they that's what clemenceau that, wanted to do they he didn't get his his uh <laughs> his desire there well historic i mean german german unification was a somewhat new thing it wasn't until it had only been a project that lasted less than 50 years at this point it started in 1870 so you know, there there could have been the the uh, the vision. You could have just redrew those maps of right. you know, where Prussia is and you know, where Bavaria. And, yeah, you get a Bavaria, you get a Brandenburg, kingdoms. you get a you know Schleswig Holstein. You, you get all those those parts. You get a Rhineland, et cetera, so on and so forth. Well, something in in I was going to kind of add this in toward the end to give the big the big uh, bang, but or the big kickoff, but. I think something that we should should kind of highlight is that this is something called the German question, mm-hmm. and this was what um, A. G. P. Taylor wrote. So he's a World War II historian, the British one, or the British one, a British World War II historian. And basically, you know, his book is about you know what he says is that the Treaty of Versailles didn't solve the German question. The German question really was is that okay, we won World War One, but now there's still 60 million people here. He's bigger than they're bigger than France. They still have an industrial base. Russia is gone. They don't actually have a check or balance against them anymore, because the old balance of power with Austria, with Russia, and the, the Russia-Franco alliance with the British on the periphery, um, it's not there anymore. That doesn't exist now. You have a bunch of small, little, dinky states that all have their own ethnic problems. Because they're basically, you know, they used to call Austria, Hungary, the the prisoner, the prison of nations. Mm-hmm. Well, all these little new nations were, were prisons of nations now too, right? Um, which which we'll jump into a couple of them, uh, because you know these were these were countries that were kind of made out of thin air in some cases. But why don't we start with Yugoslavia? Because that's that is um, one of the big. One of the first creations, so Yugoslavia is created in 1918, which is the successor state of the Serbian state. You know, Serbia being the kingdom of Serbia, which was instrumental in the, the you know, the fires that started the war, you know, with, with um, you know, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand and the, the crazy Serbian radical nationalist groups. Right. Um, it was originally called the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, but it was it turned into Yugoslavia. <laughs> and this new country included the Kingdom of Serbia, which had these territorial aspirations to unite South Slavic people. And um, there was also this short-lived entity that existed during the final stages of the war. They are part of, you know, they started to... they declared their independence uh, in 1918 when Austria-Hungary collapsed. And it was called the State of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs. And it included parts of present-day Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, and uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. It united with the Kingdom of Serbia. So this creates the, the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. And then after that, the kingdom of Montenegro joined joined this political union. So this is this is what creates Yugoslavia. So land of whatever it's called, Yugo I think means south, and then Slavia, South Slav land. See that that name makes a hell of a lot more sense. Like imagine if the U.S. was like the 
United States of white, black, Spanish, and other people. <laughs> like, it would be so fucking stupid. United States of white, blacks, Asians, Sp- Hispanics, Indians, Hawaiians, yeah. <laughs> Cherokees, indigenous people, Eskimos, <laughs> trans people, cis people. <laughs> it was just the United stupidest States. name. <laughs> I'm glad that they figured out a good short name like Yugoslavia. That's a good one. Rolls off the tongue. Well, I think the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, at least everyone's represented in there. But I guess but everybody Montenegro wasn't. joined the mix. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They were like, oh, it's too long now. We but what about, what about the kingdom um, of Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, and Montenegrins? Yeah, but what about any of the like ethnic minorities that weren't like part of those majorities? You know, they don't get included. They become well. Who cares about them? They're too. <laughs> they're too small to care about. Who the the Muslims there, or the Jews, or the you know I don't know, take a diaspora. <laughs> I mean, those are the main ethnic groups. The Serbian group, the Serbians were you know by I don't want to say by far, but they were the most powerful state out of all of them. Sure, um, or most powerful faction. I just think if you're gonna if you're gonna name your country after the top three things and ignore all the other ones, it's bound to create some you know uh, ethnic tensions. It's like, bro, you're in the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. It's not the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, and Muslims. So, you know, you're subhuman. That's that's like what would what would come out of that. It's kind of like Czech- Czechoslovakia, which I'll touch on in one moment. Mm-hmm. There's the other country is Romania. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Romania initially entered the war in 1916. I think they joined the war. And I mean, they, it was totally an opportunity, opportunistic move. They joined because they saw what they saw was a writing on the wall. Um, they joined against the central powers, and as a result, they received a significant portion of, of uh, the um, you know of, of Austria Hungary. Um, they got Transylvania. Um, you know, they got regions where there was Romanian speaking populations. Italy. They've received South Tyrol, which had predominantly been a German-speaking population in the Alps. Um, that e- South Tyrol now, I believe it's like an autonomous region mm-hmm. it's called something like Trentino Alto and whatever, bippity boppity boop. Zud Tyrol. It's in German, it's Zud Tyrol. And, and I've actually been there, uh, went snowboarding there in the Alps. And it's fucking oh. gorgeous. And it's super interesting because everything in there is in German, but like also Italian. But like everyone looks German, I don't know. It's I remember thinking to myself like, "Oh, cool! I get to go to Northern Italy." And then I went because I was on uh, uh, studying abroad in high school, and I went there for like a skiing trip, snowboarding trip, and I was like so excited to, to go to Italy. I was like, "Yeah, great! I get to cross another country off the list." And we end up there, and it's literally just Germany again. <laughs> but like some of yeah. the signs were in like both German and Italian. It was it was a fascinating place. Gorgeous, by the way. Yeah, definitely recommended. In northern, yeah, those Alp areas, they're 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 a lot more mixed. They're a lot more mixed between Italians and Germans. Um, and then, of course, there were problems when there was kind of a forced Italianization process. Mm-hmm. Process, right? Now, um, the other parts that Italy, the other lands that Italy got, they got the Istrian Peninsula and then the Dalmatian coast, and they got parts of Albania. And then they got these islands. I can't pronounce their names. They were off the. They were part of the Ottoman Empire, so they got their land. They were supposed to get a lot more, so they felt shafted. And of course, the Ottoman Empire was broken up into several pieces. Um, you know, modern day Turkey was created. Um, England and France split the remaining empire between them. The French were granted a mandate over the area that eventually becomes Lebanon and Syria. The British were granted mandates over the land that becomes Iraq, Jordan, and Israel. So. Um, or Palestine. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and then, then, so, three Baltic countries are created. So Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. They come into existence. They weren't part of these post-war treaties, though. They were created following the Russian Revolution. So right. they were, they were, they got their independence after the Russian Revolution took place. So they weren't part of the Versailles or anything like that. Um, but... The um, some of the there were German cities that were given to Lithuania after the war. I think the German city of Memel. Yep. The the German um for- the Ger- sorry let, let's stay on Germany for a second because like Germany did lose some land and in particular the weird part about how they lost some land was they had 
there was a strip in what is now Poland um, uh, that that they gave to Poland so that they can get access to the sea. We'll talk. I think we'll talk about Poland in a second, so I won't give too much of that away. But it basically had a little like, here's Germany, and then you know to the east of that was a the strip of Poland, and then farther east of that was like more Germany. It was like a little enclave, kind of like um, Kaliningrad right now uh, for Russia, where it's like not not really attached to anything, uh, and it made it like super difficult for them. And then those that area is what became uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, specifically. Yeah, the Polish corridor. So, um, so then France got back Alsace Lorraine from Germany. Um, they also got the Saar Basin which was a coal-rich industrial region in southwestern Germany. Parts of the Rhineland which were, were uh, you know, occupied as a buffer zone between France and Germany. And then, of course, they lose, uh, you know, former, former colonies that they had in Africa and the Pacific, where it what really wasn't that much compared to France and England. But altogether, Germany loses, like, 13 million people or so, or... Um, or around 13 million Germans are separated from their previous states. Now, I don't think it's all from Germany. That includes Austria-Hungary. Right. But then Austria-Hungary being, there's a large German population there. Um, but then the peace conference establishes an entity called Czechoslovakia, which is like the weirdest creation. It is, so it was made out of the Czech lands of Bohemia Moravia, and then parts of Cilicia, and then Slovakia, which had been part of the Hung- Hungarian Empire within the austro within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and unlike Germany, Poland, or Romania, or Hungary, or, or Austria, um, there had never really been like a Czech state or a Slovak state before. They'd o- they'd always been part of like larger empires, the Czechs and the Slovaks. The I mean the preceding Czech state is the the Kingdom of Bohemia, which was part of the Holy Roman Empire. Right. So which, like, I mean, some in, like the Holy ago. Roman Empire, yeah. not really being like a firm, strong, centralized state, but still like it's all it was always um, you know part of a larger entity. It never was like its independent thing. There had never been any type of Slovak state before, and the Slovaks are actually deceived into joining this. They were they were they were promised complete autonomy, which they did not get. And the thing is, is that Slo- the Slovaks were not even the second largest national group. The Germans were, <laughs> because after after the Paris Peace Accords was signed, the Sudanland was put in the border of Czechoslovakia, and Germans had inhabited the Sudanland which is a compact territory adjacent to Germany and Austria since the Middle Ages or, you know, however long. There's been a long history of them being, German-speaking people being there. And according to, and I have a census up here of Czechoslovakia. This is a 1921 census of national identities. So Czechs were 50% of the population. Slovaks were 14 Germans were 23%. Hungarians, 5%. Ukrainians, Russians... Ruthian, Ruthenians, uh, 3.5. Jews were 1.4%. Poles were about 1%. And uh, so, I mean, the Germans, Hungarians, and the Poles and Ruthenians, they constituted one third of the, of the people who lived there. And they were the national minorities. With the aim to achieve a majority Slav state and you know, legitimate the proclamation of Czechoslovakia as, you know, it, it, its own thing. This these these nationalist groups create this entity called the Czechoslovak, and it's this, this brand new national identity that was created, and it basically claimed that Czechs and Slovaks shared some common history that dates back to the medieval state of Moravia in the ninth century. Or whatever, or wherever the hell you know, it's gotta, one of those classic look cases. In, yeah, I gotta look in that because it. Uh, I admittedly have not searched that up, but I can say that this smells a lot like all of these like nation state buildings that we've covered on the show, where they just like invent or like highly distort uh, a history, like some long unbroken chain of like, oh, we all come from, 
you know, space people or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but in this case, it's the, uh, you know, great Moravia <laughs> from the ninth century. Um, great, great Moravia from the ninth century. Right. From, you but know, it, whenever, from when, whenever the hell. Empire yeah. or but again, this, this is what I'm talking about because Czechoslovakia, right? It's inherently Czechs and Slovaks, right? But as you pointed out, Slovaks aren't even the second biggest, you know, uh, entity. It was the Germans. So they have to invent this idea that Czechs and Slovaks are actually the same thing. And that would give them 64%, 65% of the population. And so therefore it like legitimizes it. Instead of Czechoslova Germania, <laughs> which probably would have been more accurate. Napoleon Bonaparte rose from obscurity to become the most powerful and significant figure in modern history. Over 200 years after his death, people are still debating his legacy. He was a man of contradictions, a tyrant and a reformer, a liberator and an oppressor, a revolutionary and a reactionary. His biography reads like a novel, and his influence is almost beyond measure. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast, and every month I delve into the turbulent life and times of one of the greatest characters in history, and explore the world that shaped him in all its glory and tragedy. It's a story of great battles and campaigns, political intrigue, and massive social and economic change, but it's also a story about people populated with remarkable characters. I hope you'll join me as I examine this fascinating era of history. Find The Age of Napoleon wherever you get your podcasts. Hey Matt, did you know that wombats poop cubes? Nope, never heard that before. Did you know the unicorn is the national animal of Scotland, Ken? I didn't know, nor do I care. Neil, did you know that Liechtenstein is the only doubly landlocked country in Europe? Jeff, isn't that an American pop artist? Well, actually, it's both. If you want to learn things like that and more, join us each week on Triviality, a pub trivia-style game show podcast where a lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. Listen in each week to answer general knowledge trivia alongside exciting guests from around the world. And we're here, too. Join us every Tuesday for new hour-long episodes of Triviality, plus tons of extra theme content on everything from The Office and Lord of the Rings to science and geography. And sometimes we even do sports. Find us on all your preferred podcast apps and take part in the fun of playing bar trivia without the need to wear pants. Real mature, Jeff. Forget it, Neil. It's triviality. Yeah, and the, and the Czechs and the Germans had bad blood between each other as well. So there's right. a lot of ethnic tension between the two groups. So, um, and it, this was actually commented on from the U.S. delegation there. So I, have a, I actually have a quote from Archibald Coolidge, who is one of the delegates of Paris. To, to grant to the Czechoslovaks all the territory they demand would not only be an injustice to millions of people unwilling to come under Czech rule, but would also be dangerous and perhaps fatal to the future of the new state. In Bohemia, the relations between the Czechs and the Germans have been growing steadily worse during the last three months. The hostility between them is now intense. The bloodshed on March 3rd, when Czech soldiers in several towns fired on German crowds, was shed in a manner that is not easily forgiven. And, I mean, there was all this violence. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these groups, like, you know, the Czechoslovakians took the opportunity to build their state when Austria-Hungary was falling. Like, Czechoslovakian soldiers seized Austro-Hungarian land Mm -hmm. during the war. Right. Um, You know, they, they kind of forged, they forged their state when they had the opportunity. But, you know, there was... It obviously created a lot of problems, creating new states where where there were still these ethnic tensions that were, you know, that never went away. All they did is they became smaller versions of Austria-Hungary. They, they became smaller, less powerful versions of Austria-Hungary. Right. The same now, inherent problems were, were there, though. With the same, yeah, with the same inherent problems. There were still prisoners or prisons of nations. Whoever, who I forget who even named that term, Prisons of Nations. Was that a Woodrow Wilson quote? I, I forget. Don't know. I forget. Now, then there's Poland. So, Poland's an interesting thing. And I think we're going to do separate episodes on Poland and Czechoslovakia to do, you know, to, to do more justice because obviously there's a lot more history than what we just laid out. But Poland is, um, you know, there, Poland hadn't been a state in a long time. So, Poland 
was basically partitioned when it was a Polish-Lithuanian commonwealth. Um, at the end of the 18th, 18th century, it was it was partitioned by three different states: Prussia, the Russian Empire, and Austria-Hungary. In Austria-Hungary, the, the Poles mainly lived in Galicia. In Russian Poland, um, it, was all, it was called the Congress of Poland. So my family is actually there. There are Russian. There are Poles who lived in Kiev. So um, they were. They honestly did pretty they actually i'm not sure what their exact relationship was with with the state or how much they liked it or not but they they had like a military tradition like a lot of the family they served in the they served in the russian empire's military they served in they served in the war during world war one um i don't think they had that much animosity with the state they hated the soviet union because they were they were um forcibly you know they they essentially were were uh, you know cleansed from the land mm-hmm. when the Soviets took over. They had they all their all their property was confiscated, um, so they had to escape to France where they lived. But in so um, in Russian Poland, it was called the Congress of Poland. Authorities were pretty, you know they they conducted a process of Russification. Um, there were Polish rebels. There were Polish separatist groups. Um, there were Polish separatist groups that tried to kill the czars. Um, you know, the, the the Polish language wasn't allowed in the public sphere. It wasn't. You know, you weren't supposed to speak Polish in contact with authorities. Many of the Poles, though, who didn't want to go through this Russification process, they ended up going. They migrate to Galicia, and Galicia, Austria, Austrian Poland was where the Polish people, you know, probably thrived the most. The The political atmosphere was a lot different. Austria-Hungary was a lot more lenient when it came to ethnic minorities than Prussia and, and the Russian Empire was. And, um, you know, the, the they were, the Poles were, were kind of like a, a top of the caste system there. You know, they were Catholics. They were, um, you know, they, they had a privileged class over other ethnic groups, uh, such as the Ukrainians and such as the Jews. You know, there's a lot of ethnic tension between the Poles and the Ukrainians and Galatians where there's a horrible genocide that play, takes place during, during you know, in, in the 30s and 40s between Ukraini- on Ukrainians and Poles. Um, and, you know, there's the, the, the really, but, I mean, I'm getting too ahead of myself. The really bad restrictions, probably the worst restrictions for the Poles took place in Prussia where there was a very hard process of, of Germanization that was conducted. So, I mean, the Polish language, was, again, was forbidden. There was no, I think, it, they, it, you know, there's no Polish schools. Um, you know, all these things, you know, ethnic discrimination stuff. The Poles hated the Germans in the years leading up to the war. So the Treaty of Versailles, it forced Germany to cede parts of West Prussia, so Posen, and in Upper Silesia, and you know the the border with Germany was drawn along the Oder and the the Nice rivers. So, the the collapse of these empires it, it allows Poland to regain its independence, and and you know all these different areas had to combine into one state. So you know the Russian territories that that became Poland. It was it was Belarus and Ukraine, and um, I, I believe it was Lviv. Lviv. Um, you know, Poland took control over Galicia and the Carpathian mountain regions, which became southeastern Poland. And then you had mentioned earlier the, the Polish corridor. Mm-hmm. The, you know, the Polish corridor was created to give this you know newly reconstituted Second Polish Republic a direct route to the Baltic Sea, and it separated East Prussia as part of Germany from the rest of Germany. And this strip of land extended from. You know, it was it was a big, like you said, it causes a lot of problems in the future. Now, um, given all this, and just to go back to a point I I was trying to make earlier, Germ- the German probably was not solved. So I had mentioned that the German population had sixty million people, still had sixty million people. You know, it wasn't carved up. It wasn't like completely. You know, after World War II, Germany was completely just obliterated, basically. 
It was completely obliterated, and you know Germany is basically a colony to this day, day, to to the United States. But you know it's carved up; it's it's chopped in half between East and West Germany. Mm-hmm. And um, you know that didn't happen then. You know, it still remained united, and it still was, you know, the German problem. If they started taking measures to reverse the Treaty of Versailles, then they could become an economic and military power again, which which they do. And now, again, they don't have the same great powers that are going to be able to balance them out because you have a bunch of, you know, wild new ethnic states or, you know, ethnic, you know, states that are basically ran by a chauvinistic ethnic majority in Poland, because the Poles were pretty nationalist and bad to to minorities. Against they were pretty bad to ethnic Germans and pretty bad to ethnic Jews. They were pretty, you know, the Czechoslovakians were pretty bad to ethnic Germans and other ethnic minorities. I mean, these these are brutal countries in Central Europe. Mm-hmm. Central and Eastern Europe is a brutal place, and they tend to be Central Eastern Europeans. They tend to be very militant. If you haven't learned that from now, <laughs> if you haven't figured it out they from tend the to last be, year, they tend to be very, very militant. So, um, and and I guess something that you have to take into account is that the realities of Eastern Europe are is that it's naturally going to be dominated by either the Germans or the Russians or both, and this defeat of both Germany and Russia. At the end of World War One, it opens up this artificial path for this national self-determination in Eastern Europe, which is completely botched by Versailles. So, it um, you know, I think I'll set it again. I want to read this quote from from um, from A. J. P. Taylor because I think it kind of uh, it it uh, it will be good to tap this off. The first world. The First World War left the German problem unsolved, indeed made it ultimately more acute. This problem was not German aggressiveness or militarism or the wickedness of her rulers. These, even they existed, merely aggravated the problem or perhaps actually made it less menacing by provoking moral resistance to other countries. The essential problem was political, not moral. However democratic and pacific... 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 Pacific, <laughs> Pacific, Germany might become, she remained by far the greatest power on the continent of Europe. With the disappearance of Russia more so than before, she was greatest in population, 65 million against 40 million in France, they only had, the only other substantial power. Her proportions was greater still in the economic resources of coal and steel, which in modern times together made up power. At the moment in 1919, Germany was down and out. The immediate problem was German weakness, but given a few years of normal life, it would again become the problem of German strength. More than this, the old balance of power, which formerly did something to restrain Germany, had broken down. Russia had withdrawn. Austria-Hungary had vanished. Only France and Italy remained, but both inferior in manpower and still more in economic resources, both exhausted by the war. If events followed their course in the old free way, nothing could prevent the Germans from overshadowing Europe, even if they did not plan to do so. And, you know, the British and, you know, there's this thought that comes out of Britain. It's like, okay, we're going to have all these problems in, in this new Eastern Europe, European landscape. The Germans could be the kind of the guiding light a democratic german germany could be the guiding light for all these new nations and uh, they can follow suit like they they, they they're going to need an economic power to to look up to well it doesn't exactly work out like that no due to a variety of reasons no and but um what one of which by the way is that germany didn't have like this history of democracy uh and some of the some of the issues that you see with the weimar republic is is that uh, especially during the times of hyperinflation, the German people were more just interested in someone coming in and fixing the problems that they had 
rather than upholding some ideals of like a democratic, you know, government. They didn't give a shit what kind of government it was. All they knew was that they wanted hyperinflation to go away. And also they didn't really like communists either. So <laughs> there was that as well. But but yeah, to the idea of the, uh, of the British that, you know, Germany could be this like shining de- democratic example wasn't wasn't something that was rooted in like, you know, history. It's, it's, we're not talking about France here, right? France has a long democratic history. Germany did not. Germany was like empires and kingdoms and shit for forever. <laughs> they didn't go through that uh, revolution like like uh, like France did. And um, yeah, I mean, I I think this might be like a good stopping point for us for now. Um, in future episodes. I'd really like to talk a little bit more about um, the Treaty of Versailles and how it impacted the Weimar Republic. And and indeed, was it actually so bad for Germany? I know that we started this episode close to the top where you had said, you know, you could look at World War II as as a German reaction to, you know, this this systems of treaties that came after. And and indeed, that that is a good way to 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 start looking at it. But I think there's a lot more nuance involved in, in including you know uh just the the political history of germany um the advances and good things that came out of uh the weimar republic uh, the involvement of u.s banking in you know the the collapse of uh, the weimar republic and indeed maybe even the rise of national socialism or nazis in germany and and, and also just frankly about like how Germany straight up circumvented the treaty restrictions and ended up rearming even before Hitler came to power. So there's like a lot of interesting things there that, that I want to explore. Uh, Henry, what, what other things do you think you want to talk about um, just related to this stuff? So I want to talk about some of the states that are, were, are created in more detail. And then I also want to talk a lot about U.S. foreign policy towards Germany and towards Japan. Because, of course, we're going to bring Japan into this as well. Mm-hmm. Again, this is not going to be in any type of chronological order. It may Sometimes it might be, but um, might we're going around. to try to tackle <laughs> a bunch of different topics and subjects and you know maybe we'll take one episode do up one episode and then contradict that episode later with another with another point of view so we'll see where it goes but for now we're just having fun with it um but let's let's bounce i have a baby that i hear crying in the distance so i need to get back (laughs) all right before my wife gets mad at me and i need to turn the ac on in my house before i get in trouble (laughs) Peace, guys. Thanks again for listening to another episode of Bro History. If you would like to support the show, the number one way to do that is to give us a five-star rating on whatever podcast app that you listen to us on. So whether that be Spotify or Apple, you can also support us on Patreon. That is another great way to support us. Um, You get access to our Slack channel and then some episodes that we have done uh, that are behind the Patreon paywall. So do that and uh support us support our work is there anything else that you would like to add nope all right peace guys peace Yeah, Film Vault. We are one of the original film podcasts. That can't be true. There was like two other film podcasts when we began, Brian. How long have we been doing this show? You and I first sat down and did a version of the show over 20 years ago. My God. Two episodes each week. One. We review movies and the first episode and the second one. Different top five every week. Movies that made you cry. Worst movie accents. Most disturbing movies. All right, the Film Vault. Check it out. Wherever you find a fine podcast. That's right. The Film Vault going on 20 plus years.